Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is harnessing space tech as a platform for business innovation. We have Cliff Beek with us. He is the CEO of Space Chain. Hello, Cliff. How are you? Hi, Michelle. I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm good. Where are you based again? Today, I'm in Washington, D.C. So Awesome. Uh, yeah. I'm excited about talking about space and space chain. First, tell us your story. Yes, my first job out of business school is I went to work for an investment bank in the APAC region, and the project was for a satellite uplink facility. I knew not a lot about satellite systems, and I got into raising capital for them, and it was fairly successful, and then I transitioned into the operational side. And what I began to discover is the significance of using space and satellite communication networks to be able to protect high value data, not being exposed to the terrestrial infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it started to evolve around how do we take the sovereignty of data, move it globally without the sort of interruption or disruption from, I would say, bad actors. So it was an interesting first start for data protection. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about Bitcoin or even blockchain? Yeah, I didn't come from the crypto world, mm -hmm. but the blockchain capability, which made the space and satellite services interesting, is the distribution of space for everybody. Part of our mission has, and mine too, personally, is like making space accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at the the sort of Web3 environment and the collection of a blockchain ecosystem, you start to realize that it actually has a capability for eliminating maybe that intermediary party. So when you look at blockchain and you look at cryptographic currency, it's a perfect fit. And where space comes on top of that is it creates more of a safety sort of security element that adds a custodial service for that transaction. So when you're transacting typically in a normal environment, let's say you go into a store and you want to use your crypto or you want to use any type of payment method, you're using that merchant's payment mm -hmm. platform. And so what we're trying to do is protect the sovereignty of your information and the data that you have. And it's just a hash address. Now, when you're making your payments, you're not exposing, perhaps giving up as much information about yourself. And that's the world I come from is every time you sign up to an app or doing something in our world today is you give up so much of your information and the security elements around that or, or the security concerns around that. A blockchain environment, utilizing it in a space ecosystem adds a higher level of security. Awesome. Tell us about Space Chain. When was it formed? What was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, so I'm not a founder. The founder is a gentleman, two guys. One is Jeff Garsick mm -hmm. and Jing Chao. And those guys had this idea of putting space nodes or blockchain nodes into space and creating this distribution of capability of accessing space, as I mentioned, democratization of space. And they had a token. The token is was a utility token so that anybody who wanted to get access to space information, they could use their token. In a university environment, you have a lot of research being done or even in a lower schools or just students in general. You don't need to be part of a large sort of government organization or a large commercial enterprise to get access to data that you're hoping to get. So today you can utilize this idea of going into space through your computer. Today, there's Google Earth Engine, and you can get some idea of, of access to that information. But we were trying to take it, and we still take it a little higher, is you actually get access to the satellite itself and the information and content that's coming off of that information, or excuse me, off of that particular asset. And then it's distributed globally in a constellation of smaller nodes. So it's riding on top of a blockchain platform mm -hmm. and creates transparency and accessibility is makes it extremely you know easily available for just the average person who wants to get access to that data in a secure environment awesome i love space and if you listen to this show there has been a few chats about space from nasa engineers <laughs> to people yeah. who actually send equipment to space yeah I, i'm just wondering who your customer is yeah like, i'm glad you mentioned NASA, because our company, we, we're like a group of like really intense engineers who come out of quantum science, machine mm -hmm. learning, 
and very innovative. This company is the only company in the world that's put three operating nodes at NASA's International Space Station. So wow. when you mentioned NASA, we've actually launched some of our nodes and, and servers into the International Space Station, which have been inserted into an environment where we've been able to test it to see how this fintech environment works at the ISS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so NASA is pretty familiar with us. And also some of our sponsors are the European Space Agency as well that has granted us the, the funding to be able to accomplish and achieve this idea of putting operating nodes into space. But I would like to give you a kind of a, some background from that. That has been a remarkable achievement, and we've done some pretty cool things. Mm-hmm. But there's other things that we wanted to explore as well. And, and one is getting the, the vantage point of space, looking down mm-hmm. and looking at the environment on Earth. And, and what can we do to be able to improve the quality of life on Earth with the technology that we've created? And a big part of our transition at Space Chain is to be able to utilize Earth observation imagery Mm -hmm. to manage and provide decision analytics for looking at the environment, whether it's methane gas leaks, whether it's for agritech, for improving decision-making, for growing corn, for example. One of our new customers is a a corn grower in Nebraska. And we love this guy because he wants to use this technology to look at crop yield, to look at fertilization, to look at areas that he has been working on for many years. And it's a three-generation farm and utilizing assets from space to help make decisions about his business model. And that has transitioned from that analytics. We could actually look at the, the quality of the corn stock based on imagery coming out of space and some of the algorithms that we have produced. It's not the images themselves, because anyone could capture images. It's the analytics that our team pulls off of that to be able to measure the corn growth yields and even soil content. And we've used that to also get same with sugarcane out in Brazil. We're working with a group on a proof of concept at multiple species of sugarcane and how it impacts their growth. So this is what I really like. The, the fintech world is interesting, it's cool, but I really mm-hmm. like the idea of utilizing our vantage from space mm-hmm. to be able to help improve life on Earth. And sustainability for food supplies, for mm-hmm. logistics is really what makes it so much fun for me. And, and I think for our team as well. Do you work with other agencies to look at aliens in space? We have so many aliens here in our company that we'd probably be offended by that. No, I think that's cool. I, I haven't thought of that, but space awareness is mm-hmm. another area that would be very interesting. I would think that would be probably <laughs> really very cool to do that. In other words, rather than looking down at Earth is creating situational awareness in space to see what's coming at you from like, I, I believe in being a, a multi-planetary sort of species that we should be able to start looking at that. Yeah. I, I totally embrace that. That's a good point. And I'm taking a note right now. <laughs> what we're going to do because that would be very cool and, that uh, will be awesome i right. can imagine the company just communicating with other species in on mars or in other planets but we we do embrace we do embrace technology to be able to detect like water for example there are various sensors that you can use to, to measure the lunar crust surface to determine if there's water in various areas Mm -hmm. and the work that we're starting to explore and companies that we have talked to to do that also on mars but not about actual living species that are able to communicate that you've opened up something that is our our next business (laughs) tell me me what should we call that what would be a name for that for us starcom i don't know (laughs) Yeah, we'll have to think about that. Maybe some of our listeners here could help give us some ideas because that is brilliant. I'd love that. <laughs> I know you're providing space as a service. Tell us a little bit about that and what the, some of the use cases are. Yeah, so the use cases are not that dissimilar to what I mentioned. Space as a service is, you know, there are so many assets in orbit today. You read about all these, and I won't name the companies by name, but there are multiple thousands mm-hmm. of a small satellites in orbit for providing communication networks, some Earth observation satellites. 
and logistics. And in general, I feel it, it's somewhat fragmented. There's just so much out there that, and I want to be careful how I say this, is putting a satellite into orbit is not the real value. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people doing that. Mm -hmm. The real value is to extract the information that's coming off of that satellite. Mm -hmm. so we don't take the, the risk of launching satellites and we don't take the risk of the telemetry and controlling their orbits. But the information that we like to put on those satellites is like a ride share. So we put a processor that could help us get the information or the transactional information that we'd like to receive. Our business model is to take a look at various constellations that are there and the portal for any user to come in and set using like a chat GBT environment. I would like to know the level of pollution or iron in, let's say, the Hudson River in New York okay. City. And you can come in and do that through our portal, and then it'll task a particular satellite or a particular constellation, and it'll start creating an image and start giving you the data that you would like to receive. And then we have a search engine inside of our particular AI component that will go and search all the various journals and information about that question. Okay. And space as a service allows the users to have some curiosity into the subject matter, but we try to take it three or four steps deeper with the analytics side. So okay. space as a service is like the first foundational sort of approach. And then we build on that. Yeah. Like somebody who wants to say, what, what is the sort of occurrence and frequency of aliens being spotted in orbit? Our particular machine learning capability will go back into the various reports and journals and pull that up and then pull together some pretty interesting, you know, facts. That's awesome. It's almost like a treasure hunt. So we're looking for X and we're looking for a map and we're looking for data to find something. Basically, we can use your services to gather all the data and you will use all the goodies on the back end, like blockchain and AI and ML to give us the data so that we can find things. Yeah, I love that analogy. As it, it is a treasure hunt and, and there's so much uncovered or undiscovered treasure in space. I, I love that analogy. That's exciting. Right now, are you focusing on the blockchain community or, or are you expanding outside of that community so that is broader? Yeah, the blockchain community for sure. That's where our foundational roots are. We started in that regard and we, we see the value of, again, this, this idea of transparency, security and participation. So mm -hmm. the blockchain community and all that is part of that make that sort of this consistency is important for us. And we're just expanding on it. We've reached a level where we're trying to focus on I would say we've used this word a lot, democratization, but allowing anybody to participate without having to go through an intermediary party. Mm -hmm. So the blockchain community is really important for us. And it's just, I think, the next level of technology and platforms that broadens the sort of the equitable sort of participation into the space arena. And we're, we're big proponents of that. The other part of that is as an open source system to allow other developers and other applications to develop on top of what we've already created. We like this idea of interoperability or open API so that if there's someone has an idea or wants to build off of that, our tech stack allows them to do it. The goal is to have as many participants as possible and to expand their own levels of interest and then share that in a very open environment. Do you have incentive for that program? I think the incentive is that for those who participate to be able to not have to put up a lot of capital and not to have to be able to do that, not to have to put their own resources into it. So it's more like a sharing of environment where, yeah, I think the incentives are that if you're a individual who wants to have access to space, for example, and that first level of access is provided to you where you're not going out and having to pay for a launch or pay for the actual hard assets to get there. And then what you're building on top of that is your own level of interest and areas of interest. The incentive is to reduce the cost of getting into space. We'll use your example. If you were someone who was really interested in exploring whether or not there are aliens in space, 
you have a platform to do that. And, you know, you can feel comfortable and safe in doing that without having to go through, let's say, a, a, a large organization that you need their approvals. We've already yeah. done that. We've had to go through NASA security process of security certificates to be able to operate our platforms on the International Space Station. So yes, security is important and making sure you have the proper sort of parameters and compliance in, in the space that we behave and everyone who participates behaves responsibly. But that sort of first barrier has been lowered and, and, and allows participation for mm -hmm. many. So the incentive is like, hey, I have an idea. I have access to a device, whether it's a handset or a computer, and I'm a developer and I want to do something that's unique and different. And I've got an idea to pursue. Awesome. I love uh, alien NFTs. <laughs> <That's possible. laughs> now you're talking. Now you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of your recent partner programs and what other partners are you looking for? We've been very fortunate that when we started, one of our first like, large vendors that have embraced us to be a part of their partnership programs was Google for cloud startups. So Google came to us and offered some really nice incentives because they see the tie-in that companies like ours and others who use their services could grow and create more and more users into the Google Cloud's platform. But mm -hmm. also the support that you get from them is really remarkable. That's one area that we're really proud to have been accepted to that. And the second one would be the NVIDIA Inception Program, oh, which also cool. gives us... Yeah, it's actually a credential that I feel really proud of that we were invited to participate in that. And the, and the NVIDIA program and what they're doing for the industry is really it's awesome. And then we've also have relationships with space providers. We have a relationship with Capella as an evaluation partner and the same thing with Iridium as a platform developer for the Iridium constellation. Throwing out some shout outs, I know, and but I'm not trying to promote others, but for us as a company... Mm -hmm. As a, we're a small company, when someone asks me, like, tell me about your company, it's like, we are a small company with a very large technology capability. Mm -hmm. And so we, when we see how we can match up with an NVIDIA whose well, their market cap is approaching, I'm going to throw out a, a trillion dollars, some large number to embrace our developers and our people, it's just, it's just it, we're very proud of that. And the same thing with a group like Google, who, who said, we think what you guys are doing is, is great, come into the Google program and be a part of our startup program for cloud services. So those partnerships are very valuable. And I look at those companies as they have their reasons to do this and their motivations, but they also look at the type of technology that we have on our team and they embrace that. And they, is there something that we can work together on and, and find ways to improve Google's products and, and also to say, hey, look, you don't have to worry about the back end of it keep doing what you're doing and we've got you, go ahead and do it. It's very comforting for small companies who operate in an environment of minimal resources, especially where we are today. What is your vision for the future? Say one year and then five years. The vision, at least for our company, is going to be a huge growth path. We've got so many cool projects going on right now with companies that are all over the world. And I mentioned a few with regard to the agritech industry and then environmental types of monitoring. We're really big on sustainability. Our vision is how do we improve sustainability for food, for environment, for monitoring any kind of, it doesn't have to be areas such as carbon credits and stuff, but mm -hmm. looking at wildfires right now have been one of the areas that have been devastating for many people, just getting humanitarian aid into those areas to give them a path and saying, this is what our analytics are telling us to forecast in advance areas of dry soil and where there's some alarming capability that we could advance. Looking at places where there are catastrophic events going on right now, how can we help humanitarian efforts with getting supplies to them by using sub-earth imagery and monitoring what's happening. We look at some unfortunate things going on in the world, but we try to put a positive notion on it that our technology can help humanity in so many ways. And so the requirement for us to be able to be responsible in the products and services that we're developing can, again, utilize space to improve life on earth. And I see the need for that right now is just on cruise control going up. I see our company just evolving very quickly and providing us a, a well-needed service to humanity.
space just seems so far-fetched for most consumers and for most companies, just because we can't even take care of ourselves. How do we even think about space? Do we think that we will be closer to the idea of using space as a service? Yeah, it's interesting. The industry has evolved dramatically and you've got to give credit where it's due. I mean, companies like SpaceX, Elon Musk, and things that he's done, and not just him, his entire team, and and there are others who've brought down the cost per kilogram for launches, for having the vision to look at taking humans to the International Space Station, and again, in a very safe, responsible manner. And there are others who are in this environment as well. I see that it is a reality, and the goal is to be a multi-planetary species to be able to put people on Mars and to have some degree of an outstation there. And it's expensive. It seems like a way out vision that's not realistic, but we're getting there. Look at the telescopic views that we're getting from space today with the Hubble Space Station, Hubble Space Satellite. We were getting some pretty remarkable information forecasting and predicting asteroids. Asteroid mining has been a really interesting part of space. To, to what is an asteroid, the quality of the rare components and minerals on an asteroid, the, the craziest ideas get funded. And to me, as a space entrepreneur, they're not that crazy. It's actually pretty cool that there are individuals and groups that want to fund this stuff and provide the tools for the capability of scientists and science and discovery. And whether it's a business Look, I think you have to be able to do this in a responsible way. And there needs to be some idea of sustainability for just the business model itself. But to have individuals who take the risk to do this and the capital behind it, willing to fund it, it's great. It's remarkable. What's the right word? It's a blessing to be able to have those participants involved in this. Cliff, if I believe that there is a fountain of youth solution in space, where we take it and we become young forever... Would someone fund that? <laughs> if you could put a business plan together, you just gave me the chills when you said that. I just thought that was pretty neat. We would call that project the Ponce de Leon of uh, space. So in search <laughs> of the fountain of youth, the galaxy of youth. There'd probably be someone willing to do it. Let's put a business plan together and, and figure out to who we could go to and, and see if they would be willing to get behind it. We need another name suggestion for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we could find one of the early discovery pioneers who are out there who are exploring, just exploring the earth. We would want to give a sort of modernized name for that, but everyone seems to be in search of the fountain of youth or maintaining some type of a live forever. There may be, I, I don't want to get too far out there. This is great. <laughs> this is awesome there, talk, there, right? <laughs> yeah. Th- yeah. Think about it. it. doesn't have to be the fountain of youth. It could actually like, like, where do your spirits go after life on earth and you are replicated in another planet or something way out there. Yeah, there could be some pretty cool stuff that we could think about. It's a duplicate of us, almost like a VR but in space. Well, it's a transition. You serve your time on Earth and then you transition to another galaxy and you serve your time at another galaxy. And who knows, maybe there is a plan for that. We are changing space and time here. If you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to us, think about how you could invest or leverage the space economy. What are your suggestions for enterprises or users or anyone who wants to get into the space economy? It's a big industry and there's a lot of groups doing it. You you can just subscribe to some of the news, you know, that that come out daily. There's so many good sources and I don't want to promote any one group, but if you were just to put on a web search, just space economy, the users could find so much and just ping me. I'm happy to give you the names. I don't want to promote any one group because it would look like as if I'm biased towards something, but entrepreneurs are a group of explorers in their own right. It takes a certain sort of curiosity, guts, and not for the the faint of heart. You really need to have a certain curiosity to be an entrepreneur and a a space entrepreneur at that. There's so many times you can imagine like you have an idea, it does not work, or there's a failed opportunity. You just got to keep going. Perseverance is really important. And space is unlimited. That's why it's a galaxy. That's why it's space. (laughs) If I'm just a human and I want to prepare for space exploration or even be part of the space innovation, or even if I'm an investor and I want to invest in the space economy, 
where would I start? Should I just Google space economy or space opportunity? You know, there's a lot of interesting things. Your question has a couple of different components. One is for someone who wants to go into space, Blue Origin and some of the other groups have had a lottery system where you could actually potentially become participant on one of those limited sort of nine minutes in space, or you can get lucky. And if you have a lot of access to a lot of capital, you can reserve a spot on one of those. I think the average price is $250,000 or something. I thought it was something. more because I met someone. Not, who it could be more. Yeah. It could be a million dollars. I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure the exact amount. And, and there's probably different levels, like whether you go on Virgin or you go on to Blue Origin or whatever. But the, yeah, they're probably much more than that. But that's one way to go is there. I think there have been like these dowels and the, these groups that where they held like a lottery system and some lucky winner actually was able to go. Oh my gosh. Uh, and then there are some interesting companies like Zero Gravity that train you to become not necessarily an astronaut, that, but train you to be ready to go into space. So there's some rigorous programs to make sure that you're healthy enough and you could withstand the launch and withstand being in, into that suborbital environment. For the younger generation, and you can always train and try to go to become an astronaut, like go into, there's astronaut programs and you, you go through your college years or probably younger and there are camps like at NASA, they have an astronaut camp that you could go to. And they may even have them for adults too. I don't know. I haven't explored it. There, there are a lot of ways to get involved. You just have to do a search and look at where your interests are. If you're a very wealthy individual, you could probably buy your way into one of those reserve a launch space in one of those commercial projects like Blue Origin, Virgin, and others. And if you're wanting to be an astronaut, there's a way in which you can be go into astronaut NASA camps as a young person. And then the metaverse probably has some kind of interesting wearable that could get you there as well <laughs> when i go to the metaverse i love to be a spaceship because it's right. kind of fun. you get to fly everywhere because in yeah. the metaverse you can fly exactly so there's that and then when you're in my generation from the 70s you could do a little micro dosing and you could just find your way to another planet just by sitting at your desk so <laughs> imagine <laughs> that you're flowing into space exactly <laughs> And just watch a lot of interstellar movies. There are lots of planetariums in, in various cities that you could go to and just let your mind go and sit back and watch some of those that are available to the museums and the public. Those are pretty cool experiences. I've taken my children to those in the past and you just sit back. I know in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, there's one really interesting the planetarium there in the park. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You can just sit back and just let it go. Yeah, I love that. Is there anything you want to share that I have not asked you? I'm good. I really enjoyed this opportunity, Michelle. And I thank you for taking the time on this wonderful Friday afternoon that we're sharing this. And I love your background. I think it's pretty cool. Again, I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and to your listeners. And if there's ever any questions that come up from their side, we'll be on the lookout for them. Awesome. I have one last question. What is one piece of advice that you have for the community? Look up. Keep your eyes focused on the stars. <laughs> and, uh, stars. You know, and keep an open sort of mind to what's going on. Again, we talked about a lot of different areas. This idea of being a, a multi-planetary species and being able to one day, and I'm sure in the lifetime of many of your listeners, will see us actually being at Mars. The opportunity for my generation, for where I'm coming from, is to improve life on Earth through access to space by looking down but the next generation should be looking up. So yeah. the advice is just look up. Yeah, I would love to gather different pieces of materials on Mars and make clothing or jewelry. That would be beautiful. Be cool. Yeah. In Washington, D.C., there's a space museum here, and they have the moon rocks. If you remember, the moon rocks mm -hmm. were a pretty good cool thing. Like so being able just to have something like that, but the minerals and some of the resources that could be in space right now it would be pretty cool to make some clothing out of that that would be awesome yeah yeah and then also to hang out with aliens <laughs> uh, well, when you, your next guest wouldn't that be cool if that was an alien yeah an ai guess <laughs> so i need an alien guest the broadcast is out if you're listening to us it reminds me of a David Bowie song, A Star Man. So, you know, if they're listening and if your signal's bright, they'll come down and contact you. Please. And then we can have a panel of aliens. That would be beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff.
Michelle, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.